Okay, so picking up from where we left off uh, in the last tutorial, speaking about uh, the kind of diagram we're going to make from this step-by-step uh, -step 3D modeling process, um, I want to um, I want to actually go ahead and show you guys how to make that diagram. So, um, as I mentioned before, um, uh, we want to, as we're moving along and modeling our thing, and, and maybe you'll have to kind of you know, remodel it or unpack it a little bit to get this to work, but you'll want to have or save like an iteration of each step in the process, in the modeling uh, process, um, like I have here. So I started off with the box and the cylinder, and then I, you know, chose an angle and location to intersect the two, and then I copied one from the other using a 3D rotation, and then I did the subtraction that made my volume. So, um, what I want to do is, is translate that into a step-by-step kind of -step, uh, diagram. And, um, and the way I'm going to do that is uh, make some line drawings and take it into Illustrator and kind of add some illustration. Um, OK, so with this, uh, with this diagram, the first thing I want to do to make, a, to make these into a diagram is go to my Named Views panel. If you don't have that panel open, which I think it's not open by default, just type in named view in the command line, and that should create this panel. Now, every time you make a drawing in Rhino, you want to, uh, especially like a rendering or something like that, or like what I'm doing right now, which is a 3D axon view, you want to save that view. Oops. So I like to have this panel open all the time so I can save views. Uh, makes it makes my life a lot easier when I'm doing diagrams and drawings and everything. Um, so... Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention real quick before I actually save a view is that this is an axonometric drawing. drawing. And so when I'm in perspective, uh, the critical, this is not a perspective diagram. The critical difference, of course, is when I'm in perspective, you'll see that lines are not parallel to each other. They're all kind of moving at different angles. When I zoom in on this, like this line is moving up at one angle, this one's moving up at a different angle. We're getting this kind of, um, again, it's, it's a more uh, kind of realistic view to how our eye actually perceives the world, um, but it's less of a kind of descriptive drawing, right? You see the difference there. So it's important that in this drawing, in this diagram, we're using axonometric as a drawing technique. It means while the image is tilted, lines are still parallel, right? So like the top edge of the box is parallel to the bottom edge, the verticals are parallel to each other, et cetera. Um, so, as I mentioned in the first video, there's a couple ways to get there. You can start from a top view or any orthographic view. You can hold Control Shift, right click on the keyboard, and drag your mouse. Sorry, right click on your mouse and drag your mouse. And then from there, I'm orbiting. So, even though I'm in an orthographic or a paraline view, I'm still I'm orbiting around into some kind of axonometric angle. The other way I can get to it is go to Set View. Down here, we have Isometric. And I'm not sure which one is the right one. And that'll actually give us like a, you know, like an accurate uh, 120, 120, 120 angle uh, if you want to do that. Now, for this assignment, I actually think it's more important. So if I'm looking at this object, I'm actually, it's more important for me to get an axonometric angle where I can kind of understand the shape a little bit more clearly. In other words, like if I put it in ghosted, for example, which is kind of like how it's going to look. When we, um, when we do our diagram, we want to make sure we don't have like lines crossing over each other too much or competing with each other. You know, like that would be kind of a confusing thing if this edge touched that edge, touched that edge. It's going to start to make it hard to understand. So we're going to, we're going to switch to an angle here where, um, where it's kind of easier to see what's going on, something like that. So again, once we're in Axon, once we have the angle we like, I'm going to save that angle with the little disk icon in the named view panel. And I'm going to call this my axonometric diagram. OK, and while I'm waiting. So um, then the next step I want to do is actually to make this uh, sequence of 3D models into 2D line drawings. And I'm just going to do it all at once because that's easiest. And uh, before I do that, maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll put these on a different layer. I'm going to call these my voids. And I'm just 
I actually put them on that layer. Color in here. Great. Actually would want to do that same thing. This. Those on the same layer, those those little sections of my cylinder. Keep organized. Okay, great. And then um, what I want to do next is what's called a make 2D. You guys may have done this in foundation. I don't know. Um, so if I select all my 3D geometry, and it's important that I'm in the view that I want because the make 2D is going to make a line drawing out of whatever I select in whatever view I'm looking in my viewport. I'm going to type in make 2D. And uh, inside, uh, so we're going to see this little panel up here. A couple of things to, to make note of. In this case, we're going to turn on something called Scene Silhouette. That's actually going to create a profile line for us, like we need an axon. That's something that's useful. We're also going to make what's called uh, hidden lines turned on. That's going to allow us to kind of see through our object. So it's, it's going to actually create for us um, like a dash line for anything that's being seen through something else. The other thing I want to make sure is set is maintain source layers under object properties. Make sure you have that little uh, um, item selected. And then when you're ready, go ahead and click OK. Now, this diagram will show up in top view as if you had drawn it in 2D. So I'm going to go to a separate viewport. I'm going to change into top view. And I should have this stuff selected, but I'm going to move it out of the way, first of all. And then the other thing, if I go to my Layers panel, you'll see a whole bunch of new layers have showed up here, which is great. And um, this, is, um, this is a nice kind of shortcut for uh, starting to line weight these drawings, because it's already separating lines into separate layers. Uh, for example, we have a layer called Hidden, within which are all the dash lines that you were just seeing there. You'll turn off. See that a little clearer. Um, so those are all the dash lines we see. That's, that's any kind of geometry that's like we're looking through one object to another. Um, we also have the visible lines, and under which we have scene silhouettes. And like I mentioned before, that's going to be any line that's kind of a profile line. It's kind of like the outline of an object. So like we draw an axon. Let me draw a profile line every time an object is touching the air. Um, this is going to kind of automatically create lines on a separate layer for that purpose. Now, one thing that you may find is, uh, you know, like right here, for example, where this cylinder is intersecting this box, there's kind of this outline, right, where that intersection happens. Like it's that edge right there, right? And uh, we don't get that in the Make 2D because they're not actually intersecting each other yet. Right? We get it down here, so we could copy these lines if we wanted to. Um, but the other way we can do that, if you want to do that before you make 2D, and it, it might be useful, I'm going to do it um, to add if I need it. Uh, I'm going to select these two objects, and I'm going to use the command intersect. That will do exactly like I was just describing, like it'll make lines everywhere where these objects intersect each other, um, you know, and not just, uh, it won't actually trim them. It'll just make lines there so that we can see the outline of how those objects are intersecting. They are, I think these objects are not, we don't want to show that. Anymore. But anyway, so I'm going to redo a make 2D. And I'm, I'm actually, it's good that it's kind of separate. So I'll make 2D this real quick. And click OK. And so now I have another like set of drawings that I can kind of line up to the original if I want to. OK, so all this stuff is kind of in order. I'm not really going to mess with it here in Rhino too much. You know, again, we could put it on layouts and line weight it in here, but we want to actually kind of illustrate it more. So we're going to take it into another software at this point. Now, um, uh, one thing I want to do actually before I get to, I'm going to take it into Illustrator. 
And before I get to that, I'm actually going to kind of line this up and, and space it out a little bit. Um, so you can see they're all kind of tilting from one side to the other. Let's imagine we want to have them on the page kind of lined up with each other. So I'm going to draw a line from that corner and I'm going to use that as a reference. Move every other drawing. I'm also going to go, okay, so I want one, two, three, four. I'm going to take this line and type in divide. I think I actually want, if I want four points, I want three subdivisions, right? Three subdivisions equals n point and then two in the middle. Okay, and then I'm just going to select these lines and move them to uh, my points. That way they're lined up and they're And they're evenly spaced. Okay, so once I'm done doing all that stuff, I'm going to select these all. I'm going to go to File and click this button, Export Selected. And that should take me... Um, give this a sec. Um, And under Save as Type, I'm going to change from Rhino to Adobe Illustrator. And uh, then I'm going to give it some name. And this is important as well. So I'm going to, when I hit Enter to save the file, I'm going to get this new dialog uh, where um, you know I can kind of uh, choose to scale my model. Now, it's pretty small geometry, like it's six inches tall, obviously. So I'm actually going to scale it, I think. Quarter inch equals a foot. It actually isn't super important that this is a scale. Like, we can still mess with it in, in Illustrator. But I'm going to scale it so that one inch in my model equals, right, four inches in my model equals one inch on my page. I think I did that right. Maybe I did that backwards. We'll find out. Um, okay. And now I'm going to go to where I saved that file. And I should see an illustrator.ai file already created. And I'll just double click it to open it. And here we are. So this is Adobe Illustrator. Now, uh, Illustrator and Photoshop are the ones you'll kind of use the most to actually create drawings or images. And the difference is that Illustrator is what's called a vector-based editing software. And that means that everything that I bring into here is, is actually a line. It's, all, it's still um, an editable line, just like it is in Rhino. Um, so I can, you know, I can move it around. I can scale it. I can change its properties. I can apply a different color to it. I can apply a different line weight to it. All that fun stuff. So I'm editing it like it's a line drawing. Like I mean, it is a line drawing, essentially an Illustrator. Now a couple things. Uh, first of all, when I'm working up at the top here, you're gonna see this drop down. I don't know what it'll say by default, but I'm working in Essentials Classic, and that'll make some of my menus show up maybe differently from yours. I would just recommend change to this, and I'll try and be careful to explain everywhere you can find whatever you need to find, but um, anyway, so these are the menus, um, and if you're missing anything, so for example, I just edited what's called the stroke of a line, which basically just means the line weight, you know, how thick a uh, line is kind of represented. And um, for example, that little panel where it says stroke is in under window and under stroke right there. Some of them are like inside of uh, sub panels. So if you're missing any panels, just go ahead and go to Window, and you should be able to find it. Um, now, these panels also, you can double-click them, and you'll see that like the number of options you have will change. So just keep that in mind if you're not seeing something that I'm seeing. Right now, like I can only change the 
you know, the thickness of the line, but I can also do a lot of other things in here if I have that panel fully expanded. So just make sure you're kind of following along with that stuff. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do before I um, start to edit my drawings is make sure my page is set up at the right size. So if you remember correctly, I, um, I exported, you know, to a certain scale, and obviously it's not very big on my page. So the question is how big is my page? One thing to do is go to view, or perhaps it is window. View, and then there's something called rulers. It'll say like ruler. You can also get to it, or just as rulers. Okay, so show rulers. You can also get to it by hitting Control R on the keyboard, and that I think is true for almost any um, Adobe software. If we want to see that ruler show up right there. We can also right click on it and change the units that it's showing us. So we want to make sure we're showing inches. So you can see our, our drawing is 24 by 36. Okay, so let's say I want to change that to 11 by 17, which is the actual size that I, I'm required to do for this assignment. I'm going to go to what's called document setup. I think you can also, if you don't see that button there, you can also go to, I think, to um, file and click document setup. And inside this little panel, it's a couple things we can mess with, but what we're going to do is we're going to go to um, edit artboards. Now you can see that my page actually, you know, has this kind of boundary where I can edit it. So I can change my paper size like this. Now, obviously I want it to be a precise dimension. Up at the top here, I can change it. I'm going to do 17 by 11. And when I'm done with that, I'm just going to go ahead and click on back on the selection tool and then i can kind of make sure my drawings are more or less in the right spot now one thing that can happen when you export from rhino illustrator number one you can export them huge so for example if i do the same thing export selected i'm just going to call this test let's say i didn't do this i do it the opposite way Now what's, what's happening, I think, is uh, first of all, my objects are really, really big. So that's my paper and that's my workspace. And you'll notice that anything I try and do, it'll just error out for me. Um, so again, the paper and then the dark gray boundary is like the only place it'll allow me to do anything. Um, so when I'm stuck with something like this, I actually need to go back to Rhino and export it smaller. The other thing that can, that can cause this to happen is if for some reason I have my drawings like way out here, away from the zero, zero point of my file, and then I go ahead and I export them same way. This time I'm gonna choose the right scale. So four inches in my model equals one inch on the page. And I'll open that guy up. Oops, which one did I just overwrite? Wrong one, obviously. Uh, let me just close both of these. All right. Okay. I'll overwrite my test file. So even when I have the right scale, uh, you can see that when I place objects in Illustrator, um, they'll show up near or on my paper space based on where they are in my Rhino file relative to zero, zero. So even though I exported this file, you can see when I zoom all the way out, my drawings are nowhere to be found, right? They're nowhere. And that's because they're so far away from the zero, zero, they didn't even show up in the workspace or in the like preview space or anything. So if this happens to you, it's probably because either your scale is wrong when you exported or uh, your drawing is super far away from the zero zero in your file. So fix those things and uh, and then it should work for you. Okay, so returning to our drawings here. Um, this, uh, this is what we're going to use to start to edit the line weights of our drawing here. Now, uh, you'll see in the layers panel, we have an individual layer for every layer that we had in Rhino. We can turn them all on and off. We can lock them, kind of like in Rhino. 
And if I wanted to select every line on a certain layer, let's say I want to go in and make these red lines black. What I do is I select that little circle at the very end, the right-hand side of the layer, and then I'll select everything on that layer. If I want to change something from one layer to another, I select the line, and you'll see that that little uh, layer highlights a swatch, a little color square block, and I just drag that to whatever layer I want it to be on, and now it's on that layer. So I've just moved an object from one layer to another that way. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do when I'm editing my lines is I'm just going to select everything. And I'm going to change the line weight to something a little lighter. I'm going to change the color to black. So over here in my colors panel, I have two options. I have what's called a fill and what's called a stroke. Fill is when I have a closed outline. So like this, again, it's a vector representation. So I can adjust the properties of the outline, thickness of it. When I'm on stroke, I can adjust the color of that. When I'm on fill, and the little white box with a red line through it means I'm not applying anything to it. Oops, I had to have it selected. So when I have that guy on top, I'm editing that guy. And so that's filling in my shapes. For the most part, we're uh, not going to have that problem because none of these lines are joined into like a closed outline that we could fill. But anyway, so select all the lines, go to stroke in the color panel, and set it to black. And so that's our first step. Now I'm going to go layer by layer and kind of edit each layer. So first I'll go, what is this layer? This is my hidden curves voids. OK. So I do want this to be kind of like a lighter other than black. I'm going to change that. I'm also going to make it a lighter line weight. And in my stroke panel, I can change the properties of its dash line. And so over here under dash line, I can turn it on and off to make them not dashed. See that's going away. Um, I can also change the, the spacing of the dash by just typing in numbers here. I have to double click there. There we go. Two and two, so that's the dash and the space, and we can, you know, change it to as many different ones as we want. Um, and so I think, you know, what's cool about that? I'm actually going to apply a color uh, to start to add this kind of layer of illustration, which shows, you know, like the intersection between uh, a geometry and a uh, uh, and like a solid. So I'm going to make this red. Some kind. Whatever color you want. I'm just going to choose one color. Okay. I'll make it red. And I'm also going to drag this color down into my swatches panel down below. Again, that can be found in the window uh, under swatches. And that way I've saved that. You know, it's, it's a specific red, green, blue color code, CMYK color code. I don't want to like bother trying to match it or type in the numbers every time. I'm just going to save it in my swatches. So other times when I want to use it, I can I can click again. Okay, now I'm going to turn that layer off so I can see what I'm doing a little bit. Then I'm looking at hidden lines. Uh, that should be the rest of my hidden lines. So let's see. So those are most of the hidden lines for the box, the volume. So uh, I'm going to make those actually black. I'm going to make those a lighter line weight. And I'm going to make those a different uh, pattern. Kind of the same pattern. So there we go. So that's where, how we're showing the box in places where it's cut through. Um, and we may have to do a little bit of editing to get things on the right layer, but we'll deal with that in a minute. And now we're just doing a first pass. Now we have also these scene silhouette curves. And we have them for both layers. And what I'm going to do with those, I'm going to crank up the line weight. I'll do that. I have that for both layers again. And so you'll, you can see right away, that's what I was talking about a minute ago. It'll make it so that the outlines are darker than the, you know, the lines on the inside. Uh, I am also, I'm going to, so if you find that there are things like this where it's not like kind of perfect, I can use, I can cut stuff. So there's a cut tool. It's also C on the keyboard. 
I can cut it. So I want it to look like that line does. I'm going to select that line, move it onto that layer, and then I'm going to use the eyedropper tool, to match it with that layer, or with an object that I want it to look, to look like. So once again, this line, I want it to look like that line. I'll select it, I'll cut it. Little scissors tool, just click where you want it to cut. I go back to the selection, I can select it independently. First, I'm going to move it to the layer. I don't get confused and mess things up if I want to change things later. And then to change the appearance of that line, oops, I guess I have two lines there. Um, so I'll just delete that one. And to change the appearance of, of that line or any other line to something else, I just use the eyedropper tool, which is, uh, uh, there it is, the little eyedropper. It's also I on the keyboard. And then I'll click on whatever line that has the properties I want it to have to match that. Okay. I'll turn these other li lines back on. Now, um, the last thing I'm going to do here is the thing. What layer is that? There we go. There we go. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to make these ones also red. It starts to get a little messy, and we'll have to kind of clean it up. But we can do that. Go. Anyway, um, so we can deal with that as we go, and we're going to use that to kind of distinguish between one and the other. But we'll, like I say, I will deal with that. Okay. Now, what I'm going to start to do is um, actually illustrate this object by kind of shading it, by like filling it in with shaded colors. Now, in order to do that, I'm actually going to copy stuff because it's a lot easier to kind of deal with the layering of copying. Um, and I'll show you why in a second. But anyway, so we're going to move this up a little bit. Kind of centered. This row is like our main sequence of diagrams. I'm going to select this row and I'm going to copy it. I can do control C, control V. I can also hold shift and alt, alt on the keyboard will allow me to copy it. Okay, so a couple things. Let's say I wanted to shade in my box. I'm going to use a tool called the Live Paint tool. So like I mentioned before, I don't actually have a fill um, that's like, uh, you know, uh, like I don't have a closed outline that I could fill with a certain color. Um, but what I do have is um, uh, the live paint tool that can like allow me to fill in anything that forms a closed outline. The live paint tool is K on the keyboard. It's also here under the shape builder tool. And that allows me to click inside outlines that are closed, that are you know, made out of closed lines or lines that form a closed outline. And then I'm going to set up my color swatch. I set it to black. Here I can also in the options, which is these three little lines at the top right, I can change it to grayscale, scale it back, and I can start to basically fill in bases of my box. And then I'll back out, and you'll see what just happened is it made this whole object one thing, and it's on one layer. And that's why we don't really want to mess with trying to have the lines and the fill be the same. So now once we've filled it, we're going to go back, select the stroke, and just set it to the white line, the white space with the red line through it. And so now it's kind of like this shaded background thing. I'm also going to select it and change the opacity, which you can get to up here at the top. Or you can get to it in the transparency panel right there. And then I'm also going to make a new layer. I'm going to put it on that layer, and I'm going to put that layer on the bottom. So it'll show up behind everything else, and then I can go ahead and throw this guy up here as an underlay uh, to these other drawings. Um, OK. Now I'm going to do the same for this guy. And now I'm going to start to fill in uh, uh, you know, my outline uh, of my shape. Uh, not just, so for example, I could, could take this 
and copy it. That it represents the box over there, but let's say I wanted to show also the cylinder. How am I gonna fill that in? So I'll select all these lines again. Go to K on the keyboard. I'm gonna set my red color and I'll color in the end cap like that. Now let's say I wanted to show the face of it, but you know, it's a cylinder and we want to make sure we shade it in a way where we can see that as like a curved surface. So um, I'm going to hit K again on the keyboard. This time I'm going to the gradient tool. And uh, actually, uh, oh yeah, here we go. So in the gradient tool, and again, we can get this, get to this by going window gradient. Uh, we're setting up which uh, linear gradient. And in here we can we can change the properties of our gradient. We're going to actually create a gradient that uses this color and I'm just dragging from the swatches panel. And so we can also edit this by clicking, double clicking on one of those swatches down there. That'll like allow us to change, you know, what each bar is, okay. And then I'm going to back to my live paint tool and I'm filling in, oh yeah, okay, I forgot one thing, which is that we need to get rid of the other lines before we do this. I'm gonna save that. Go back to before I made a live paint object out of this. And obviously it's simpler anyway. I'll just delete all these lines we don't need. Okay. okay, so again, select the outline. Go to the gradient tool, linear gradient. Uh, and I'm dragging in my color swatch. I can drag these ones away to remove them. Bringing it in, there we go. Oops. And again, we can adjust the properties of that by moving all these little sliders around. Okay. And then I'm using my live paint tool and I'm clicking inside that outline. And I can also then adjust the kind of angle of it. So that's not working right. Um, annoying. Okay, sorry. So let's get rid of this outline as well. Uh, okay, great. Um, so one more time. Linear gradient. Okay, awesome. I paint that guy. Okay, great. And I'm also going to do a red this top thing here. Okay, so now when I select this, I think, um, I can actually apply, sorry, and apply the, uh, gradient uh, to the object. So I'll select it. And once I've live paint it, I can use that gradient. I'll just click it over here as the fill. And then I'm able to actually edit the angle. That's what I wanted. And I can get it to line up to whatever angle my object looks like. And I can still kind of mess around with how that looks. Looks OK. And uh, but we could still also go back in and live paint the end so it looks different. Okay. And then I'll go ahead and remove all the outlines. I'll turn down the opacity. Throw it on my background layer. There we go.
there we go. So now it's kind of like shading uh, my object. Now I can also, I have these two objects uh, and they're on the same layer. So the way that I, you know, make one appear in front of the other is just like I would in, um, in Rhino, I can select one and I can go arrange, send to back. Or I can select the other and go arrange back. And you'll see that'll change like kind of what the appearance is. But you can arrange things on the same layer so that they are layered in the proper way. And we're starting to get some good results with how that looks. Yes, you know, I don't know. Why is there Anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and then I could also, you know, bring these lines down. And if I wanted those to kind of represent a certain action, which again would be this kind of cutting through of the volume. Turn off the dash line, uh, or I could make it a dash line with a heavier line weight, perhaps. And that way, we can uh, get uh, this highlight of where the volumes are intersecting. Now, the other thing that I want to show, potentially, like if I'm showing this volume intersecting with that one, and then I'm showing, uh, you know, okay, so I take this volume and I, I rotate it around that central axis. So in this frame, I'm going to apply different line weight and kind of display property to my central axis. Maybe I won't keep it a dash line, but I want it to be kind of different pattern so it's read separately. And then I'm going to use the, uh, uh, I think there's an arc tool, which is but we can also use the curvature tool or the pen tool here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw like a little um, circle so I can illustrate that I've rotated this guy around a central axis and made this guy. So I'm going to use the pen tool. I'm going to click somewhere and drag. And what will happen is I'll make little, little handles when I do that. So. And then when I'm done, I'll just press Enter. Now, in Illustrator, we can use what's called the Object Selection Tool or the Direct Select Tool. And the Direct Select Tool, see what I'm doing better, will allow us to edit individual control points. So if I wanted to come back in and try and make this appear more smooth, do that by moving the grips. After I've drawn the curve, I can also move the actual points around if I want. And it'll look different somehow. Anyway, so that's one way we could do that. We could also, um, you know, just draw a circle and cut it. Be under here, lips to it. Again, cut. That actually looks a lot better, so we'll just do that. Okay. So I'll scale that. That'll be like my kind of set rotation line. And then the last thing I want to do is I want to add a, an arrow to indicate that rotation that I'm like, you know. Actually, you know, it should be a 180. That's how far we're rotating. So about a 270. Okay. And Again, under stroke, I can go in here and I can add an arrowhead of many different types. I kind of like number nine. That's actually the opposite of the direction we're rotating, so I can click this little swap, start and end arrowheads. There we go. And I could bump that line weight up and then also independently scale the arrowhead using this little scale factor right here if I didn't want it to be too big or too small. 
Okay, and that's kind of what we're going to do in these diagrams. We're going to use like uh, some annotation and stuff like that to illustrate the operations. Like, what are the steps that we're going through to create this? So, and and actually here as well, we should have a rotation. Um, so, if you hold on real quick. Okay, so once you have the drawing fully composed, it should look something kind of like that. Um, just using all the same steps that I was using before and kind of working in individual objects and layers. So the final thing that we want to do here is add, um, like I said, we have our annotation, which is symbols. And we also want to add uh, some notes on, um, uh, you know, what these steps represent. And so I'm going to use up here, I'm going to use the type tool. I can click and drag to make a little window. Um, and I can say, uh, uh, cylindrical volume subtracted from, uh, from module. Okay. And I'm going to left justify it. I'm going to make it a font that looks good. I'm going to make it, I'm going to give it a step one. I'm going to make sure the font size makes sense. And, and then I'm also going to like line each one up. So I'm, I'm clicking and dragging. I'm holding alt. You'll see my cursor is doubled up and then I'm using my smart guides, which is those little magenta lines. And I can even create guides here. Yep, so I line that up right by clicking and dragging from the rulers there. I'm holding shift to keep it straight. I'm holding alt to go to copy it. Okay. So now each one of my text boxes is like lined up. Let me go to and write a little bit of description about each one. And then ultimately the last thing I want to do is down here at the bottom, I'm writing my name. I'm writing ARC 241, 2020F, P3. And actually, uh, well, it's a good thing to always do this on any document, but you also then we're actually going to do it when you put this in a layout. So I'll talk about that more later. But again, you always want to make sure you label what project it is, what your name is, all that stuff. And then we could also write a title on here. Again, we're going to do that actually in uh, InDesign. Um, but anyway, so then when I'm done with this, I'm just going to save it. And uh, it'll make me change the file name. I'll just save it. Fine. Okay, and then, uh, uh, you know, I would take this document and uh, place it into an InDesign file, and there I would leave a title, and I would leave my name, the Kakavi, on each page, and so on and so forth. And I can do that for you guys in a separate uh, video. Um, but that should wrap up the kind of Illustrator diagram portion of this assignment. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and end it here.